Welcome to Lab 4 Podcast on angiosperm diversity. Joining us is plant biologist Ernesto Sandoval. Hello, Ernesto. Hello, Merlin. So can you explain the ecological relevance of angiosperms and basically how are they important to human society? Well, um, as primary producers, they are the foundation of ecological systems because they fix carbon. And with respects to humans, there's uh, uh, food, fuel, clothing, and housing. Um, so dead plants from the Carboniferous uh, that led to the oil and coal deposits equals fossil fuels. Uh, we're actually burning dead plants, uh, not uh, dinosaurs. Also, uh, with respect to food, there's uh, the endosperm from uh, four types of grasses uh, that provide 50% of the calories that humans consume uh, across the world. So uh, corn in the Americas, rice and its relatives in Asia, wheat and barley in Europe, and a lesser-known grass called sorghum on the African continent. And then with respect to clothing, there's cotton. Trichomes from the cotton plant provide most of the clothing that we wear. And then finally, thanks to secondary growth, uh, we've got the wood for our homes uh, and other structures that we build. And a lot of those are from the uh, carnivore forest. That's right, thanks to the bifacial vascular cambium. So moving on, let's talk about the association of angiosperms with pollinators. What are the major pollinators and what are those pollinators attracted to as far as um, flower morphology? Right. So um, the most important pollinators of plants are the hymenopterans, uh, the bees and wasps. Uh, these insects are typically looking for food and flowers, um, sometimes even mates. Uh, so you have a landing pad, some kind of way of landing in the flower, uh, oftentimes yellow. Um, and there are all those ones that look like insects. Um, uh, anyways, so then next you have the butterflies and moths, uh, which are the lepidopterans. And uh, these guys mostly like to land, but there are moths that can hover. So, so and, and because they're some, like, some of them are going for nectar, you have tubular flowers. Um, oftentimes for the butterflies, they're clustered. The flowers are clustered. Flower, they like to land and sort of poke around and things. Um, then there's flies, the third most important pollinators of plants, uh, and their relatives, the dipterans. Um, these are, you know, mostly flowers that smell off, uh, sometimes look moldy, but things that flies are attracted to. Uh, so sometimes it really is poopy smelling flowers. So they're attracted <laughs> to certain um, characteristics of the flowers, but what are the um, sort of the main reasons pollinators go to flowers? What are they looking for? Right. So they're looking for uh, pollen or nectar. So and then, you know, I just want to point out that if say you want some pollination. Well, the beetles <laughs> are number four. Uh, for pollinators and those uh, they're kind of clumsy flying insects so they need a pretty good landing pad um, anyways that's sort of their big things kind of big place to land um, and then people always think oh birds pollinate flowers well they only pollinate one percent of the world's plants um, they haven't been flying nearly as long as the insects uh, and so they, they also birds don't smell so the, the uh, they don't have the flowers don't have any smells to them. Nice tubular flowers because birds are primarily pretty much going after nectar. So the tubular flowers, red is oftentimes a color for them. Um, and then, well, there's other mammals get an honorable mention from pollination. That's all. Because you really need to be able to fly to be a good pollinator, correct? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's move on and um, talk about flowers as far as their diversity. So um, can you highlight some extremes? of flowers and um, that shows the angiosperm diversity? Yeah, well, I guess it, it, I would say the orchids are the one of the most crazy group of, of plants that have crazy ways of getting pollinated. Um, the Darwin orchid with its super long nectar spur where a moth uh, unrolls and wiggles into the flower to get the nectar and the process picks up pollen. Uh, those orchids, set of orchids that where the flower looks like a female insect and the males try to make out with it. Um, that's pretty crazy. Going to flies again, Amorphophallus titanum, the corpse flower, smells like a dead animal, brings in flies and beetles that are looking for dead things to consume in the process of pollinate the flowers. So let's move on from the, the flowers and the extremes of flowers to the extremes of fruits. Can you sort of um, highlight the extreme by sort of telling us about a fruit that's a little different in the angiosperm world. Yeah. So, um, you know, the final purpose of a fruit in a plant is to aid in dispersal. And uh, sometimes it's a short distance, sometimes it's a long distance. In the case of the coconut, 
It's a long distance over ocean, so you've got this giant seed inside of this inedible fruit that's basically a floating device for the seed inside. With lot, this, and the seed has lots of energy, so it can float in the ocean, um, survive probably months or weeks floating there until it reaches fresh water. All right, Ernesto, thanks for joining us talking about angiosperm diversity. You're welcome.